Welcome, 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 Housers, to another episode of On the Way Home. Uh, thank you so much for joining us week to week as we have amazing individuals that, and groups that come on the show and talk about the innovative and different uh, things they're doing across the country, around the world, in an effort to end homelessness and create affordable housing. We're so lucky to have so many people in this space doing very cool things. And this week, we have two guests uh, that fit right into that mold. Before we get to this week's guests, I should tell you that this podcast is made available because the good folks at Blue Door, where I am from, I'm the I have the good fortune of being the CEO of Blue Door, an organization that's been around for 42 years, uh, working primarily in the north of the GTA, greater Toronto area, so in uh, York region, Peel region, and Durham region. Uh, we have a mandate that uh, different forms of affordable housing, uh, all the way from emergency to semi-independent living as well. We do uh, We have programs that dip into healthcare to make sure people are getting healthy so they can keep their housing. And we have a construction social enterprise called Construct um, that really uh, lifts people out of poverty, gets people into the trades where they make a living wage and a meaningful work and desperately fill, uh, or sorry, fill the need uh, we desperately need uh, in the trades to build the housing we desperately need. That is Construct, a very cool program. You know what? I'm going to stop talking. Just go to bluedar.ca, check out all the great work that we're doing with my team of 100 plus people there. They are awesome. So check that out. We do this in partnership with the Canadian Alliance and Homelessness. They are advocates. They are leaders, uh, national leaders in this work. They are trainers. Check out all they do at caeh.ca. Uh, and as well, of course, they run a massive conference that is happening this fall in Ottawa, and you want to be part of that. I'm sure they'll be looking for submissions for people to present at that conference soon. So check that out. Let's get to today's guest. Occasionally, we have giants in this sector uh, that come together and say, man, we've got a massive problem to tackle. Uh, and you know, everyone's doing their little pieces. How can we pull some people together and do something truly really different and, and cool? And that is a group called partners uh, for affordable housing. And two of the individuals uh, that are involved are Joanne, or sorry, Jolene Livingston and Steph Jones. And Jolene and Steph join us this week. We talk about um, how partners for affordable housing came about and, um, and what its mandate was, uh, what they're trying to do. They're really trying to help. They're looking at everyone's doing little bits around affordable housing across this country. And what if someone could pull that all together and scale it uh, much larger uh, moving forward? We talk about that. We talk about why they came together, um, how it was established, uh, will it work? And there's proof in a uh, uh, concept in, in Calgary. Uh, we talk about their mandate. We talk about what they anticipate their impact will be. Um, and how they can help us move towards a Canada where everyone can realize the right to housing, uh, what their you know five year plan is, what success looks like, um, and much much more. Um, if you're familiar with Steph Jones, he came on the podcast uh, a couple of years back. Worked for many many years uh, with CMHC, doing great work and in innovation there, and continues on with his work. And, and uh, Jolene's been running Bespoke. Uh, for a long, long time, and and doing all sorts of different projects. So some brilliant people, uh, and they pulled others into the sloop. I've uh, been fortunate enough to um, get some insight into Partners for Affordable Housing. I think it's a brilliant concept, right? If we want to do this nationally on a scale, if we need people to help us pull together uh, financing and figure out how we can do this to really make impact, this is a group that's going to do that. Uh, and I love the innovation. I love the drive. They're doing it off the corner of their desks right now, hoping for funding. But if anyone can get this work done, uh, it is this group of very uh, smart, innovative, talented, and passionate people, partners for affordable housing. Let's go to that podcast now. I think you'll enjoy this as much Julia as I do. Stefan, thank you so much for joining the show today. Eager to chat with you about all you've been up to. But before we get going, we always start with the same question for everyone. Now, I, I feel that uh, Stefan is, is at an advantage because he's had to answer that. Well, maybe, I don't know if you were on when we had this question because you were one of the early, early people. So maybe not, maybe you don't have this advantage, but we're gonna start with Jolene nonetheless. And that question is, what does home mean to you? It's mm, a good question. Uh, 
First, I'll, acknowledge, I'll acknowledge how fortunate I am to have one, not just walls and a ceiling, but a home in a neighborhood that I was fortunate enough to choose. Uh, home to me is quiet mornings, hot coffee, cuddles with my doggo, coming home at the end of the day from work to my men, two teens and a husband. And while I'm not always overly excited to make dinner and have the TV blasting in the background, really grateful to have these healthy humans at my side and the bustle to come home to. And I think finally ending the day in bed again with my doggo at my side with a good read. Amazing. Thank you. Stefan. Uh, I'll add that. Uh, so I fundamentally believe that home or having a safe and secure place to live is a human right. Um, I am fortunate enough to have a home myself. Uh, it is where I raise my kids. And as Jolene says, I have a partner and um, we put down roots and we have a community and we feel connection to that community. Um, I'll also get a little bit uh, personal and vulnerable here. Uh, my mom passed away two weeks ago. And um, the, it's funny, since then, the, the memories I've had of my mom are anchored in our childhood home. And so it reinforces to me the sort of the, the thread that a home has in someone's life and the connection that we have to family and the associations that has the home. And so it's just uh, what I've gone through in the last few weeks has just really brought that home for me. Well, thank you so much for uh, for the courage to share, uh, Seven. It's, you know, quite often one of the themes in what does home mean is really around family and uh, you know, you both talked about that in the links to family. So thank you so much for sharing. Now, you both have long careers uh, in this work um, and have done some amazing stuff. But are, are, for our listeners that may not know, I'm hoping you can walk us through that journey. Uh, Stefan, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Jolene. Okay, thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, for people that don't know me, uh, I spent the better part of my career 25 years at the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. It was a fantastic place to work. Uh, it treated me very well. Most of the things I have in life, uh, I can attribute to my time at CMHC. I grew up in that organization, starting at a, a very junior sort of analyst level and worked my way up to executive roles by the sort of the, the last uh, bit of my 25 year tenure. Uh, got to uh, experience a number of different roles at the organization. The, the, the unique thing about CMHC is you can have four or five different careers all under the same roof. So I worked in the social housing program side. I worked in our commercial mortgage insurance business. Uh, I worked in several support functions like human resources. Uh, and towards the end, I had uh, what was probably the best job of my career, at least to this point, uh, was I was uh, leading a, a new innovation team at CMHC. And Michael, that's when you and I crossed paths for the first, first time and I was on your show. Um, again, the best job I ever had. And it gave me the, the ability to actually look outside the corporation um, and just uh, appreciate the amount of capacity that there is in the private sector, especially in the housing space, You know, people, organizations like yourself who are wanting to do important work around housing. And that, with the housing crisis in this country the way it is now, I think it's more, than, more important than ever to, to tap into that. And so last April, I left left CMHC after 25 years, decided a, a change was uh, was the right time for a change and um, have started to dip my toes into that private sector. Jolene and I crossed paths on LinkedIn uh, last summer. We kind of hit it off and she was telling me about this Partners for Affordable Housing Foundation that she was founding. I found it really interesting. I had no experience in the sort of philanthropic space. So there's a there's a learning edge there for me. But I certainly have deep knowledge in the housing system and a deep network of people that I know. And so I brought that to the table and we've been collaborating since then to kind of get to this point. Um, and I think we're starting to pick up some momentum, which we'll talk about soon. And um, thankful for having this opportunity to be on your show and uh, spread the word a little bit. Wonderful. And we're thankful that you continue uh, to work in this sector. This is fantastic. Jolene, how about yourself? Uh, what does your journey look like? Yeah, so um, like Steph, I've had a 25 year career. Um, I would say for me, it's been a bit of serendipity and a calling. Um, you know, I've always had a passion for the social sector. 
Um, I remember saying from the time I was graduating high school that one day I was going to be a social worker and that never actually happened. But <clears throat> I started my career um, in partnerships and sponsorships for a corporation out in British Columbia where I was actually funding projects in the community. Um, and over time, I made my way into the sector. And so I spent the better part of two decades as a fundraiser, and that's not to be confused with selling cookies and bake sales and events, <laughs> <laughs> but working on quite significant projects. So I've worked in fundraising on capital campaigns for over two decades now and pretty significant capital campaigns. Um, I've seen that some have gone exceptionally well and others have felt like pushing a boulder uphill, to be quite honest. Um, I think what I've learned is that fundraising can play a really significant role in meeting capital project funding goals if the fundraising team is brought in at the very beginning of the planning and if there are other conditions lined up to make it work. Um, if we are part of the conversation early on, we can look at creative ways to work with philanthropists, corporations, foundations, governments, and financers to stack and scale funding and really look at the creative ways that you can make a project go forward. Um, our passion for the nonprofit sector is that um, they do vital work. They're on the front lines of the most social systemic issues um, that our country, actually our world is facing. And I feel like sometimes, well, often. Um, the sector can be undermined. Um, there can be a lack of capacity um, in terms of equity and pay and ability to hold reserves and equity to get into these projects. And there's a multitude of barriers that face them when they take on these big capital projects. So we have worked really hard um, to wrap our heads around capital project planning, um, getting in at the ground floor, um, and so over the last five years, we've really done a lot around the affordable housing space. And it was through that exposure that we started to realize that there was a funding gap at a national level. And so what Steph brings to the table in terms of affordable housing knowledge, we bring to the table, we being my team at Bespoke Social Profit Solutions, bring to the table around fundraising and finding you know, facilitating the relationship between public, private, and philanthropic funders to help nonprofits get projects over the line. Amazing, and thanks for that great uh, segue into Partners for Affordable Housing. Uh, we are in the midst of a housing crisis. I, I think daily we're bombarded by news that uh, is not positive. Talk to me a little bit about how this all came together, Partners for Affordable Housing, because there's a number of people involved uh, from idea to actually <laughs> rolling forward. Yeah, so you want me to jump in, Steph? Uh, so we're affectionately calling it PIFA, which is a terrible acronym, acronym, and it might not be the long-term name for the foundation, but it really is about partnership. Um, so right now, PIFA is a national nonprofit, soon to be charity, and our mandate is really threefold. Um, one is raising funding from private sector corporations and philanthropists at a national level um, to both top up projects, but also um, longer term, hopefully have some capacity building grants to allow nonprofits to really do the due diligence and pre-planning work that um, helps them have predictable and effective builds. Our second mandate is a knowledge hub and we're working closely with CMHC around a piece of technology that they've developed called Capital Connects, which um, is well positioned to become a repository of projects across Canada, um, whereby we can bring, it's a marketplace more or less, and Steph might talk a little bit more about this later on, but um, whereby funders can see what the projects are in any state of phase, in any region, by cause across the country. And right now, nothing like that exists. And then finally, um, lifting the voice on behalf of the nonprofit sector. So we envision doing big public awareness campaigns that really put the me in home. I heard on the CBC the other day that um, facts don't change culture, stories change culture. And we really want to destigmatize and dispel the myths about who it is that needs affordable housing and 
recognize how important it is to our community um, just from, you know, social belonging as well as economics that we're all appropriately housed. And um, my team will hear me say this often, but we're, we're kind of all one degree of separation from somebody that is or could be homeless. And there are lots of factors involved that don't discriminate. And we really believe we need to dispel that myth. And so big, big national awareness campaigns think along the lines of Canadian cancer or Bell Let's Talk, uh, but for housing. Uh, to put it on the radar of every community citizen and also afford them the ability to contribute in a way that's meaningful for them. So that's PIFA in a nutshell. Um, I can tell you kind of how it came about, but Steph, before I move along, is there anything you wanted to add to that? So add to that, uh, to that second mandate you pointed out, the Knowledge Hub and Capital Connect, um, I'll add uh, a bit of an innovation thrust. Um, I think once the foundation is up and running, of course, the principal objective will always be fundraising um, and awareness. But I do hope with time as the foundation matures, there's an opportunity to explore um, innovation in the housing sector. Um, it is something that's a particular passion to me. I think it's important. I think we need to be thinking about how we deliver housing differently, more effectively, faster, cheaper, etc. Um, there's many things working against affordable housing at the moment. And um, you know, while I hear the supply argument all the time, and I get that, uh, I think we need to be thinking about um, just different ways to, to deliver housing. For example, alternate construction techniques. There's lots of advancements happening in that space, particularly in other places in the world. And I think um, there's a, a large or significant opportunity here in Canada to explore some of that as well. Um, so I hope that becomes, with time, something else that the foundation can sort of make a, uh, make a dent in. Yeah, so um, I'll maybe just add kind of the genesis of the PFAS story. Um, my company, Bespoke, was fortunate enough to receive a contract that involved partners from a campaign that was held here in Calgary called Resolve um, and a demonstration initiative that was occurring between CMHC. And so Resolve happened from 2012 to 2016, and it was nine community agencies that came together with uh, the build community to do a capital campaign and they raised about 75 million from private and philanthropic funders and more than 200 million from three levels of government over six years and it caught a lot of attention um, both nationally and internationally and did a lot of great things for the community 21 new buildings 1800 calgarians housed and um you know, raised awareness in our community, at least, of, of the need to invest in housing. But it was a limited time effort, and it has come to conclusion. Uh, the work we did with CMHC and the Resolve Partners was to really take a look at what Resolve did and how it could be replicated on a permanent basis here in Calgary. And so through that work, we spoke with many, many, many stakeholders, both uh, here regionally, but also at a national level. And what we learned was that there's no one entity look at, looking at generating additional capital for nonprofit projects from philanthropists and corporations who have national interests in the area. And so when we completed the de demonstration initiative, we started talking to CMHC and other corporations and national philanthropists to see if this was something that um, existed we felt that it probably didn't based on what we had heard and whether there was need for it. And we've heard a resounding yes. Uh, so we've been fortunate enough to have uh, some really strong volunteers working alongside of us. We've done all of this work over the last two years pro bono. And we're at a place where we're about to begin operations. Yeah, very exciting. And a lot to unpack there from what you both uh, have shared. Um, I could tell you, being a small housing provider in uh, the north of the GTA, we have a, a project we're trying to get off the ground and to raise the capital for that extremely difficult, even though, you know, it's on the minds of all government. It, it really, and it baffles me where I'm like, it can't be this hard when you have a willing partner with land to build affordable housing, but uh, it is. Uh, so glad to see this. And if I, I hear it correctly too, it's really, and I see this often is we're all kind of doing these little pieces scattered around the country instead of having maybe that one voice or that one group that can raise capital so we all could benefit. I mean, it's simplifying things. 
but I, I hear that that loud and clear. Outside of just applying to government, really, there is no other mechanism. And you, you, you fundraise. And we've been told that sometimes by government. Have you thought about fundraising? Which sounds like a pretty funny question. But, uh, you know, that is kind of the backup to when you can't get when capital's not available just straight, straight from uh, government funding, right? I mean, so this this makes total sense. Uh, Julie and I hear you're saying, too, there's a, a great um, movie out right now on charitable that talks to the charitable sector in a sense, almost being in jail. I ask, you know, we're asked to perform at a level that's equal to for profits, but held to a different standard of you can't pay people too much. You can't all these, you can't, but we want the same result. Right. And that's, that's going to change. People have to wrap their head around that. When someone, the fundraiser, you would know the question shouldn't be how much of every dollar, but what is the impact of this dollar? Right. But we're, we're asking the wrong questions and, and uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the life of nonprofit and fundraising is very difficult to do. So glad to see this. You talked about you, you, you've got some momentum, you're rolling. Where are you kind of now? What's, what's happening? And, and what are the plans for, say, the next five years? So right now we are at the precipice of kicking off, I would say. Um, we've done a lot of due diligence over the last two years. Again, kind of a, a bit informal and then and, and we have actually done a formal study. Um, we right now have an investment from the government of Alberta. I'm located in Calgary. Um, they were here watching the result campaign unfold and they see they have a real appetite to have that uh, replicated in our province and see the uh, wisdom in having it happen nationally. So um, we have a number of irons in the fire around starting with our um, operational funding. Over the next year, it's our intention to get out into communities across Canada, uh, have some conversations with them, understand the nuances, understand some of the barriers they're facing, start to socialize um, the, the foundation and also start to populate the repository so that we can really start to market and fundraise for those projects. Our goal is really to at this point, as we're building and our mandate, we are fully aware that it is going to shift and evolve, evolve as it needs to. Um, we're really hoping to take a very enterprising and entrepreneurial approach to this. And we're hoping that the board, as we build it, will be very much aligned with um, that kind of mindset. But for now, our goal would be to raise the operational dollars at the same time as we are raising funding for capital projects. And so we really see kind of the first tranche of funding hopefully would start to occur within about 18 months. Um, and how much that is, we've done a pro forma, um, we've been conservative, but um, we hope to have the first tranche of funding going out in 18 to 24 months. And it would really focus on kind of projects that need top up funding and or acquisition projects that could be brought to market fairly quickly. Um, Steph, do you want to add anything to that? Um, I'll just to make that real. Uh, we are having conversations with, with various uh, developers, community housing providers, etc. that are, are facing challenges now. And I won't name names. But just to give an example, uh, there's a relatively uh, well known developer in a relatively large municipality in this country. <laughs> Uh, who has uh, 50 condominium units that um, they would like to sell to a local community housing provider at below market rate. Um, they have also been talking to the municipality about the municipality waiving development charges and property taxes for those 50 units, as well as speaking to CMHC about a contribution from the co-investment fund. Um, and despite those significant contributions, however, uh, there's still about a 15 to $20 million shortfall for that community housing provider to be able to finance those 50 units and keep rents at below market levels um, for, for their, their the, the people that they, they, they support and serve. It's those kinds of gaps um, that, you know, and there's, it's, it's, it's relatively small. I mean, you're, you're talking 50 units, but it's 50 units that can be delivered for people in need immediately. They're, they're built, they're ready to go, uh, and there's just this, what seems like a relatively simple financing gap that can't be overcome. Uh, and I hope that's where the foundation will time with time can help fill those gaps and get, get those kinds of opportunities across the finish line because it's so desperately needed. Mm -hmm. 
<clears throat> yeah, I, I hear you, but I mean, it, it's listening to this and saying exactly that. So when we were doing the performa for ours. It was, if we actually do this with the money that's available, we'll have one unit that's 80% of mid-market rent and the rest will be market. Not what our, our mission is, right? Yeah. So, so, but the gap, as you talked about, Seven, like, you know, so so, that's uh, that's wonderful. And having that one voice, I think everyone's kind of going to these bigger developers, and and they would they would love the fact that I could give to one group that, in a, in a sense, umbrella can help all these others. Uh, and that's a it's just a straighter path from A to B and simpler. And my impact's going to be a heck of a lot bigger, right? So greater impact, fewer connections, a little more simpler, uh, simple. Right, uh, going forward, um, and so it sounds like a, a great idea. Uh, who's who's all involved? Now I know there's the two of you. I know there's a lot of people involved. Who are some of the people that uh, have come on board? So we have my team, and I'm a team. We have a team of ten at Bespoke. Uh, Steph came on as a volunteer, but working himself into a role. Um, and Shelley Mayer, she has. Uh, Ramp Communications out in Toronto. I met Shelley during the pandemic um, online. We have a pretty cute story that goes behind it, but uh, yeah. long story short, uh, we started to do some work together. She does what I do for fundraising, but on the marketing and communication side with similar clientele, a lot of nonprofit clients. And so both very, very passionate about this social profit sector. So very similar values, uh, serving a sim similar client base. We've done some projects together. We've done some speaking engagements together since the uh, pandemic. And I invited her to volunteer with us and thankfully she was up for the challenge. And so uh, there's four of us that are playing executive roles right now. So Lorraine Jensen on my team, Steph and Shelley but we are starting to amass a bit of an army of ambassadors behind us, advisors, um, and we're starting to build a team. So for right now, my team has been, and Shelly's team have been proactively working on this, but um, we will start to build the PIFA team out with the funding we receive. Very nice. And, and, and the reception, how was the reception been so far when you're talking to people about this, or talking to funders, are people excited, welcoming? Really great. Yeah, really great. I mean, you know, you were talking about having one voice. And for instance, there's over 800 providers, housing providers in Ontario. When we did the work in Calgary, there was over 55 just in Calgary alone. And so, you know, if you look at a corporate mandate or a philanthropist who has uh, national interests, you can't task them with the um, with the uh, the work of going out and finding projects and making investments of scale across the the province or across a region that they care about or nationally it's too much work and it's not core to their mandate generally um and so we're really proposing to you know bring together a, essentially the repository repository of projects and allow them to invest at scale in areas or by cause um in projects that are meaningful to them without having to do all that footwork on their own. And so, yeah, we have, you know, we've had many conversations. I would say, you know, we informally have had about 200 conversations with individuals representing government, representing the build sector, philanthropists, family foundations, uh, community foundations. And we have yet to hear anyone say that this is not a good idea or that it's already being done or that there's not room for us in the space. We certainly don't want to get into um, replicating anything that's already happening. Uh, but we, yeah, it's been great. It's been great. The reception has been really good. And for a startup, and you'll know this, Michael, starting up a new charity is a slog. Um, you know, we don't have the same kind of access that, you know, an entrepreneur would have to venture capitalists or you have to work probably four times as hard to, um, you know, provide a case study, show that you've got um, experience and get funders to come on side. And generally nobody wants to be first, but we're seeing, we're seeing some trust and some hope. And like I said, we've got some good irons in the fire and, and we've received really good feedback. So Steph, do you want to add anything? 
Uh, I'll just uh, I'll echo what Michael said earlier uh, that it's it, it's a very disaggregated um, sector and um, again to what Jolene said every person he's spoken to sees the need for sort of this umbrella organization that has a national perspective on this um, and as part of that we are in conversations with CMHC about a partnership with them I think that's an important uh, domino um, that we would like to see fall into place uh, and hopefully will here in the next few weeks. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, we've amassed a pretty impressive uh, panel of advisors and you know prospective board members who are willing to join us and have been supporting us already. So I think that's a good sign. Uh, and I just think we have to keep pushing forward. As Jolene says, it is a slog, um, but uh, the, 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 there's so many gaps that need to be filled and a, a, sort of a cohesive thread stitched across this sector to bring the players together because you know, there's lots of capacity happening in individual pockets, but it's not being amassed together and, you know, everyone put it pulling in one direction or there's people working across purposes or people working on the same ideas and initiatives. Somehow it has to get pulled together. And we think this kind of a national foundation can be the body to do that. And, and actually, you know, I think I was at, uh, uh, I'm on the board of the Canadian Housing Renewal Association. We were talking last week and Ray Sullivan, the amazing executive director there, was talking about how government is saying the sector almost to do what you're doing right now right so everyone was talking about this acquisition fund we need acquisition but we need acquisition everyone said well uh, we, we don't want to talk to 14 different groups about acquisition fund can you figure it out come together and give us an avenue we also don't want to run an acquisition program mm -hmm. uh, to almost to step your point with a partnering with cmhc where cmhc is going to say listen we i again they haven't said this but i would guess we'd rather give dollars You work 25 years in, in government, in a sense, you know, uh, it, it's uh, um, arm's reach, but but it is slower, right, uh, to happen. Yeah. Yep. And that's what we're proposing to do. You know, if we waited for most of these organizations, you know, when we did the uh, landscape, when we looked at the landscape here in Calgary, you know, we talked to more than 36 agencies and most of them had no fundraising capacity. You know, the bigger ones may have had a resource, uh, but if we were to wait for the sector to build up their capacity and experience in fundraising to make this work and work together, it would take a very long time. I mean, they're, they're focused on their core program, getting their build projects underway, as well as having, um, you know, serving the clients that that need their services as well so fantastic and now talk to me about uh, all goes well we get some funny things get rolling what will you know in five years from now you say we were successful what does that look like what will that that feeling be or or point what the feeling will be but what will that look like so i'd say number one we have a highly capable team in place and an exceptional board of directors. So I would say we've we've got the core right now. We're gonna need a lot more bench strength as we build. Um, we are spending a lot of time being very, very intentional about how we build our board, making sure that it's um, geographically dispersed, but also competencies um, that really support the mandate and support uh, you know, the voice of nonprofits and the individuals that require the housing, so academia, social services, build sector, you name it. We've put together a pretty, uh, I would say, comprehensive matrix. So we're starting on that process. Success would look like we have an online repository of projects and we have um, traffic into the site uh, and we're able to use that site as an ability to go out and talk about the projects uh, with funders and connect them to funding projects. I would say we're able to provide funding that allows for nonprofits to stack and scale with governments, grantors, and other financers, ideally a pool of funds of more than 100 million within the five, first five years and growing. And that we're starting to change the narrative. We're putting the me in home for all Canadians. 
that's what I would say the first five years would look like if successful. Stefan, anything to, to add? Uh, yeah, I'll add that. Uh, so I spent the better, like I said, my career at CMAC, and for the most part, I was in roles that were what I would call kind of back office. You were in program administration, um, a lot of internal, you know, movement of paper, uh, a little bit removed, or in some cases, a lot removed from the front lines and the actual delivery of housing. And so my hope is that uh, over the next several years that we actually are having an impact. There are actually units being delivered. Uh, I really want to see housing get built. Um, it's something that I think I've, even though I've worked in housing my whole career, it's something that I think I've missed a little bit. Um, and I really hope that this foundation is a, is a, is, is a pathway to actually seeing new units delivered to market. Um, and that's done through creative means um, and that we've got the funding to do that. And the other thing I'll add, um, I do want to make sure that, you know, anything like this requires pretty sophisticated governance, you know, how, how funding is being allocated, uh, where it's being distributed to. But I'm also leery of, you know, what I would call over-governing. Um, we, you know, we need to move fast. Um, mm -hmm. There's a crisis. And often community housing providers are at a bit of a disadvantage in the market when it comes to housing. Um, they, they don't necessarily have the wherewithal or the capacity to move fast. And so I hope that we can right size the governance so that decisions are being made effectively and prudently, but also quickly. Uh, and I don't have the answer to how we do that right now, but it is something I have in the back of my mind that as we mature and progress, that we're making sure we kind of keep that in focus. Totally concur. Yeah, well, well said. We need the house, we need it now, uh, and we need to have levers in place to make that happen. Uh, thank you both. This has been uh, a fantastic conversation. I'm excited about this uh, as a provider, and I think our sector has lots to be excited about. If people want to learn more about Partners for Affordable Housing, where can they go? www.pfah.ca. And our contact information is there. They can see all of the advisors that are working with us. We've outlined our mandate, and there's more information coming. Uh, we'll start uh, offering a newsletter within the next month or so. So if people are interested in uh, following our journey and um, getting involved, by all means, sign up for the newsletter. We'd love to have them there. And uh, yeah, that's it. Beautiful. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time. Thank you for doing this, first of all, so people understand this is, in a sense, I hate to say out the corner of your desk because it's done well, but it's done in addition to everything else you're doing. So we appreciate the passion that you put into this. This is going to work. I've got a great feeling about it. Uh, people, go check out that website. Get involved. Um, if you have any questions, reach out. Uh, Jolene and Stefan, thank you so much for taking the time today to come on the show. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Michael. I'm an honor.